Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, this is session number nine in our sessions on having healthy relationships. And we've talked about have, how to have relationships and with different people and, and, and things. And we've talked about how you can't have a relationship with someone else until you get your relationship straight with God. You've got you've to get everything right with him. Or your relationships with other people are just never going to work out. And then, <clears throat> once you get your relationship right with him, you've got to get the relationship right with yourself. The Bible says that we are to love, Jesus said this, he said you're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And some people can't love their neighbor because they don't love themselves. Now we're not to love ourselves to where everything is about us, but you are to have a love for yourself that equals the love of God for you. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And if you are worth it for him to die for, then quit talking bad about yourself. I've heard some people talk so bad about themselves, and then they wonder why they aren't doing any better than what they're doing. But Jesus said, you get what you say. And if you say, I just can't amount to anything. My life is nothing. If you say, I'll never be well like I should be. If you say, I'll never be prosperous. Some people, everything they touch turns to gold. Everything I touch turns to doggy do. You say those things, and then you get those things, and then you wonder, why did I get that? It's because they are self-fulfilling prophecies. And the words that you speak as a believer contain power. They contain faith or they can contain doubt and unbelief. They can't contain the blessing or they contain the cursing. They contain life or they contain death. And you are the one who proclaims what is in those words. Your words, think of this as your words are containers. And when they come out of your mouth, they contain the curse or they contain the blessing. And you must understand that even the things you say about yourself, and I cannot emphasize this too much, even the things you say about yourself that you really don't mean it, those words still matter. Because the forces in the realm of the Spirit the angels of God and the fallen angels of the devil, if you will search this out in the scripture, you will find, especially, for example, in Psalm 103, 20, you will find where these angels are sitting by, standing by, waiting to hear their commands. And the Bible says in Psalm 103, 20 that the angels of God are listening for the voice of his word so that they can perform it. And when you speak a curse, it may not activate the angels of God, but you are giving spiritual force to the angels of the enemy, and they still have power. You say, now wait a minute, I thought Jesus defeated them on the cross. Jesus said to his disciples, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. So yes, they have power. <clears throat> Otherwise, Jesus would have said, I don't need to give you authority because after all, they don't have any power. No, he didn't say they didn't have power. He said, I give you authority over all the power and you take that authority with your words. <clears throat> now when you say, well, that's not really what I meant. I really didn't mean that. That's why Jesus said, you've got to watch the idle words that you say. You've got to watch the words that you say that you don't think mean anything. And then he goes on to say his very next statement is, by your words, you will be justified. 
and by your words you will be condemned. You say, well, how does that work? That's because the angels of God and the fallen angels of the devil, <clears throat> they don't know if you're joking or not. They go by what they hear. It's kind of like when I went to the restaurant with some ministers down the street a few years ago when the pasta house was still open. The waiter came up and I joked with the waiter because I knew the waiter. And I was sitting there with some minister friends and he said, what would you like to drink? And I said, <clears throat> what do you have in the way of liquor? Kind of a dumb thing to say, but I said it. They all chuckled. And I said, no, just um, make that with a coffee. So everybody got their coffee and their sodas and whatever, and he brought my coffee, and I went to drink it. And when I went to drink it, it didn't taste like coffee. Now keep in mind, I've never been a drinker all my life. I don't know the terms. I don't know what they call them, you know. Uh, I don't know the difference between a, a margarita and a vodka. Or are they the same? See, I don't know. I don't know. So when I went to drink my coffee, it tasted horrible. And what? And I looked at the waiter and I said, what did you put in this? What's, what, what's wrong with this coffee? He said, well, it's, and he named off some kind of fancy li liqueur that it had in it. And I said, well, why did you put liquor in my coffee? He said, well, you said. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I didn't. And then I'm thinking back, yeah, I did. But I was joking. But he didn't know I was joking. His job was to hear what I said I wanted and to go get it and bring it to the table. That was his job. That's all his job was. I don't know how much he gets paid an hour. His job was to walk over to my table, ask me what I want, what I said what I want, and he goes and gets it. If I'm joking, he doesn't know I'm joking. Now, in some ways, this is the way it is with the angels of God. When you say, I'll never amount to anything, the angels of God just sat back. How can they assist you when you're speaking condemnation upon yourself? Well, when it comes to our families, we need to understand this. What we say over our families is just as important. I've been around parents before who have said, oh, my kids, they'll never amount to anything. And then they get mad when years later they don't amount to anything. But the reality is, you get what you say according to Jesus. Let's take a look at uh, some thoughts here for a moment. You know, in a household, you've got, well, it depends. Uh, sometimes kids grow up in the, back in the day, I wanted to get out of the house as soon as I could. When I turned 16 and got a driver's license, I was out of there. And I only went home when I had to, to eat and sleep. I was a teenager. I was going through the youth age. In this area that we live right now, things are a little different. Sometimes youth extends up into the 30s and 40-year-olds. And instead of wanting to leave my house, instead of wanting to leave home, they think of ways to stay home because after all, see, I wanted to get a job, and I got a job so that I could drive my Pontiac that had blue lights in the wheel wells and rolled and pleated interior and Cadillac taillights. And I wanted to get a job so I could buy gas so I could drive my car. But today, it seems like they want to stay home, let their parents buy the gas, and they'll just drive their SUV. I don't know. I'm not being critical at that, but I'm just saying sometimes people have more people in their household now than what they had 30 or 40 years ago. And things do change. Society changes and shifts. But what you need to understand is how many heads of households do we have in here tonight? You're the, you're the head of your house. Okay. You have authority over that house. 
I saw that. You have authority over your house. You have authority over the people that come to visit your house. You have authority over your children. You have authority over what's in your garage. Let's put it another way. You are responsible for what's in your house. You say, well, I've got cable TV in my house. Let me tell you something. You're responsible for what comes through that cable. I've got a DVD player. I've got a Blu-ray player. You're responsible for what gets played on that thing. You say, well, these kids today, you just can't stop them. They got their phones. If they're your kids and you're paying for the phone, then that's your phone. And you're in charge. And you say, well, I don't know what they're watching on their phones. Well, that's dumb. You should know what they're watching on their phones. You say, well, how can I do it? Let me tell you something. In these electronic days, figure out a way. There are apps, there are ways you can do it. Because your children, whether you realize it or not, they're relying on you to train them. It's just like when, when London was up here a few moments ago, and I told him that I felt like the Lord wanted me to do training with him over the next few years. He hugged me. Did you see that? He put his arms around me and hugged me. Why is it? It's because children desire to be trained. There's something in the DNA of children. They want us to train them. And we can either train them good or we can train them bad. Let's look at a scripture. Let's take uh, Acts 2.39. <clears throat> For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. See, there's a promise to you and there's a promise to your children. But what you need to understand, it's your responsibility to make sure that the kids know what that promise from the Lord is. I've had parents come to me and <clears throat> I've asked them, I said, have, have your children received Jesus as, as the Lord and Savior? Or are they saved? And they go, well, we, we're not trying to push them in that direction. You mean... You might want them to go to hell. Hello, get behind them, push. Do everything within your power. Today I met with a, a man from a company in Tennessee, and we met in Versailles, and we were at a restaurant, and we were having a business meeting, and then we were going to go to an attorney's office. And so this man's in his suit, and we're sitting there, and I have... My, my mother was in this meeting. So we're in this restaurant, and we were going to get a bite to eat before we went to the attorney's office. And he looked up, and he said, <clears throat> are we going to pray over the food? I'd never met this man before today. He said, are we going to pray over the food? Well, my first thought was, he must be a grounded Christian because you don't just run into business people that say that. And so I said, sure. So I prayed over the food. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak the blessing upon this food. I call it sanctified and blessed. And bless everyone here at this table. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, he leans back and he said, that's only the second time in my life anybody's ever prayed over the food. Well, why did he say that? Well, I found out later it's because he went on the internet last night and looked me up, who he was going to be having a meeting with, and he figured that I probably was going to be praying over the food. So he said that. But see, that's where we can have an influence over people. Now, that may only be the second time, but I wonder if this young man, he looked to me like he's maybe 35 or 40 years old, I wonder when he goes to one of his other meetings at his office in Nashville or somewhere around the country, if he's going to say to somebody, you know, I was having a meeting with some people and they prayed over their food and they were adults. See, sometimes people think the only people that pray over their food are just little kids. And then I've seen parents try to get cute with their kids. Bless this food, bless this meat. I'm getting hungry. Come on, let's eat. You know, you know, bless the tub, bless the grub. You know, and all this kind of stuff. Let's don't get cute. Let's be serious. And let's let the children pray. Let's train them. Because what you put into them 
it, they're, they're like computers. Garbage in, garbage out. You put good programming in, and you get good programming out. So I would say probably the number one thing, if you want to have good relationships with people living in your house, your children, uh, you may have uh, a mother or father who's living in your house. Uh, you may have an aunt or an uncle that for one reason or another, you're taking care of them. You may be living by yourself. I'll tell you what, you got to pray over your house. You got to pray over those who are in that house. If it's your house, it's your responsibility, you're in charge, don't be passing the buck to the devil. Because if you're not going to speak blessings over that house, trust me, there's going to be an entity there that wants to speak cursings over your house. So you've got to pray. Pray for your children. You say, well, we were at church a few weeks ago and one of the teachers laid hands on them and prayed for them. No, 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 no. That's good, but you lay hands on them at home and you pray for them. Lay hands on them. Sometimes you really want to lay hands on them. You know. And that's another thing, you know. Uh, the Bible actually does say this, spare the rod and spoil the child. You don't beat children and you don't hurt children, you don't injure children. But there's nothing wrong with discipline. And God made their little behinds with padding for a reason. And they learn. And they learn for a long time. Now look, there may be some people that won't even like me for what I'm getting ready to say. But my daughter, Sherry, she works here at the church. You all know her. Uh, she's a graduate of Oral Roberts University, graduated with a degree in mathematics and, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, psychology. She's married to my son-in-law, who is a senior scientist for the Department of Defense. She's sharp. She's got three girls. One of them is dating Billy Brim's grandson. <clears throat> One of them is uh, dating, um, I won't mention his name, a, a young man. She's her second year of college and dating a young man from Oklahoma City. And the other one uh, has been training for soccer and actually went to Costa Rica a few months ago and played with a women's United States women's soccer team. Uh, and she's just a, uh, still a junior in high school. So, I mean, sh Sherry has raised her daughter as well. She's trained her husband. <clears throat> but I remember a day when I would tell Sherry to do something and she was about three or four years old and she would say, no! And she would say it that way. And, Ron, you probably remember this. She would, she'd come out, and I'd say, Sherry, when we would have Bible studies at her house, when we lived at that, that greenhouse down on the lake on the point, we'd put the kids to bed. Robbie would go to sleep. Robbie would go to sleep anywhere. He, he'd go to sleep in a restaurant with his head in the food. You know, he would, he, Robbie, <clears throat> we would find Robbie in the hallway at the house. He couldn't make it to the bedroom. He would just... You know, he would just be, we'd say, we thought he went to bed hours ago. Well, he started that direction, but he fell asleep. I mean, he just, and to this day, he's a sleeper. I have to go to his office and wake him up every now and then. <clears throat> but Sherry wasn't that way. Sherry was always kind of strong personality, strong-willed, very strong-willed. And we say, uh, we're going to be having our Bible study now. Now you kids are going to bed, you know course we take Robbie and put him in bed and he'd go to sleep and and Sherry would just stand there no so <clears throat> Loretta and I prayed about it and we just decided that we needed to break that defiant spirit because we felt it was a spirit so I went in and sat down on the edge of the bed and talked with her and she says no and you kind of got that valley girl look. I mean, she's little, but she had that look down pat. And uh, <clears throat> so I said, well, okay, bend over. No. So I bent her over and gave her a swat. I came back into the living room. Loretta says, where is she? I said, she's went to, she went to bed, finally. She's, she's asleep. I'm, Loretta says, no, she's not. She's standing right there. And Sherry's over there. 
So I took her in and I gave her another swat. Came back out. Loretta says, did you give her a swat? I said, yep, I did. I said, it hurt me worse than it did her. She said, obviously, because there she is. <laughs> and this went on and on and on. And finally, we, we just, I told Loretta, I said, I'm going to do this as many times as it takes. And after a while, that little padded area back there started getting red, you know, after about five or six trips. And, and she came out, and I remember the time she goes, no, <laughs> you know, back in the bedroom we went. And finally, she broke down and started crying. And all joking aside, she's never done that since. There was like a personality change. And you say, well, wasn't that kind of cruel? No, actually, the Bible says for parents that if you spare the rod, in other words, if you don't discipline, spare the rod is just a term that means discipline. If you don't discipline your children, they won't be disciplined. And then you can't blame them for not being disciplined because you are the one who didn't discipline them. So, yeah, we need to pray for our children, pray for those in our house, but that doesn't mean that you just pray for them and walk away and put up with anything. Because what you condone, many times people will push it to the limit, you know, and, and, you're, and here's something else too. We've been talking about relationships, and I'm talking about a relationship with your children, not a friendship with your children. Now, I am a friend with my son, but we are both in the gray beard area. <clears throat> we are friends, but I'm still his dad, and he's still my son. And yes, there can be a type of a friendship, but when parents try to become friends with their kids instead of being the parent, no, no, you have to be the parent. And I don't care, you can go out there and you can buy the skinny jeans and get the pointy hair with different colors on it and try to act like a, like a kid, but you're not a kid. And all the other kids know you're not a kid. And somebody, and this happens frequently, uh, I've, I have people who really like the idea that I show up to teach with a tie. I have some people that really like that. And they send me little, little emails, thank you for dressing up for Jesus when you preach. You know. And I've got other people that said, why do you do that? You know, you, you like, what are you, some kind of a stiff-necked person that just, you know, always got to go around with a tie? What? Well, here's the deal. You've got to be you. You've got to be you with your children. I'm not expecting you guys to come in here on a midweek service and everybody be dressed out in tuxedos and ties and high heels and evening gowns. <laughs> come on. The people out there can't see you. But we got people in Australia looking at me right now. And so I'm just, this is just me. It's the way I am. I feel more comfortable in a tie and a jacket than I do speaking without it. One week ago tonight, I was speaking at uh, a church that seats about 3,000 people in uh, Greenville, North Carolina for their Wednesday night midweek church service. And the pastor said, Tonight we'll go casual. I said, good. I didn't bring my tuxedo. <clears throat> but I did have my, I did have my tie. <laughs> I said, to me, this is casual. This is, it's, but it's okay. See, and, and people shouldn't condemn me because I wear a tie. And I shouldn't condemn them because they don't. It's not about how we're dressed. It's, as long as it's decent, it's, it's about our hearts. It's about our hearts. And uh, when it comes to our kids that are in our household, we've got to be watchful as parents that we don't try to make them something that projects us. We should let them be children. You know? Now, I know this sounds silly, but if they're... The rest of the kids are wearing green striped tennis shoes to school. Let your kid wear green striped tennis shoes. Doesn't mean you've got to wear them. 
But if the rest of the kids are going to school naked, put your foot down. See, that's, that's where you have to have wisdom. You are the wise one in your house. You know what matters and what really doesn't matter. Some things matter. Part of the problems with relationships is that people focus on things that don't matter. It doesn't matter. Certain things just don't matter. Hmm. Here's something else, too. The people in your house, you need to speak the word over them. Say what God says about them. Don't say what the devil's trying to put in your head. Because the devil will try to put things in your head like, they're an idiot. When it comes to relatives, how many of you have relatives? Have you ever wondered why the phrase friends and family is not just one phrase? Why these friends and family? You ever wonder why it's two different groups? It's because it's two different groups. See, your friends, you pick them. You choose them. They come over to your house because you invited them. They're friends. Family, they come over to your house because they feel entitled. And they're kind of like they kind of own your house. And so you have to deal with them in different ways. But regardless of that, it's still your house. And you have to speak the word over them. Bless people when they come in your house. You know, we've done this for years. When people come over to our house, it doesn't matter if it's who it is. First thing that we do when they walk in the doors, we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you bless this fellowship time tonight. As we play cards, yes, pastor plays cards. Okay, as we play cards or watch our movie or, or just sit around and talk, Guide us by your Holy Spirit. Speak the blessing over this evening. And Father, we just speak that no one gets sick, that everyone's fine. And, you know, just a, just a prayer over the house. <clears throat> it's my house. If I want to pray over my house, I can pray over my house. You don't like to hear a prayer in my house? You don't come to my house. Stay home. And you know what? I really don't care. Because... I learned in the Bible that I'm supposed to love me as much as God loves me. And I love me enough that I enjoy me. And I can have just as much fun at home by myself as I can with some goofball relative or neighbor who, who just is going to complain about everything. Are you following me? You know, it's, it's okay for you to like yourself. Let me, let me tell you something. If you don't like being alone... Now look, we all want companionship. We all want companionship, all of us. We want to have friends. We need companionship. But you shouldn't be afraid of spending a day or two by yourself. You, you shouldn't have a fear of that because you should enjoy yourself. You should be able to, you should be able to fellowship with yourself. And if you can't, that usually means you don't like yourself. And then again, as we said the other day, there are some people who love themselves so much that if somebody else fell in love with them, they'd get jealous. All right. Listen to this. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not, depart <clears throat> shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, that's grandchildren, says the Lord, from this day and forevermore. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at the Scripture. His word is supposed to be where? In your mouth is supposed to not depart from the mouth of your descendants, and it's not to depart from the mouth of your descendants' descendants. That's your grandkids. All right? Do you see that? <clears throat> but where did he put the word? In whose mouth? The descendants' descendants? The descendants or your mouth? 
Okay. See, that's a little hidden nugget there. He put the word in your mouth. And then he commands that his word be spoken by not just you, but by your descendants and your descendants' descendants. How do they get the word? He gave it to you. How do they get it? You are to speak his word over your descendants and over your descendants' descendants. You have authority over your grandchildren. Hmm. Now, here's, here's something that's kind of interesting. You've always got to speak the promise and not the problem when it comes to your family. Keep in mind, you choose your friends, you're stuck with your family. All right? All joking aside, I'm, I'm telling you the truth here. On my mom's side of the family, there were incidents that made it to the television show, 60 Minutes, 48 Hours, and the ID Channel. I have relatives on my mom's side of the family that made it to the Investigative Discovery Channel. On my dad's side of the family, there is a television special on the ID Channel, and it made it to 48 Hours. about an incident that happened. I've got criminals for relatives. But I love them. They're all out of jail now. They've all got college educations. One of them's even a pastor's wife. Praise the Lord. Good, good woman. But here's the deal. All of them that were caught up in all these things that they were caught up in over the years? I truly believe, had the word of God been spoken in their house, that they wouldn't have gotten into the things that they got into. Because, I'm telling you, as a, as a kid, I knew that there were things I was not supposed to do. Now, I still, you still want to pretend like you're doing those things. <clears throat> How many of you have ever seen a 58 Chevy? Oh, I had a friend. He, we were in the bell choir together. We played at the Southern Baptist Convention together. We were the special music. And he turned 16, and his dad bought him a mint green 58 two-door Chevy Impala. And then he went out and bought 59, 1959 Cadillac taillights and put them on that thing. Those, those, those big, long taillights. And took off one muffler, and, and oh, it was cool. It was cool. And so he and me, we both went to church together. Our parents went to church. Evidently, my parents read more scripture over me than his did. And we got a couple of other guys, and these guys were all like 16 years old. Well, I was 14, I believe it was at the time, or something. And so we went out went late one night driving through Swope Park in Kansas City <laughs> with the top down. It, did I say it was a convertible? And we were cool. And somebody said in the front seat, said, should we get it out now? So they pulled over, and they had a case of Schlitz malt beer, something or other, in the trunk. Now this is back in the day where See, today people take a beer can and they go, Nong. well, they're just made out of aluminum. Come on. My mother can squeeze one of those things down. She's 90 years old next week. But back in the day, these things were made out of steel, I think, or something. I don't know what they were made out of, but they were, I mean, you know, you had to put a vice on them, you know, and crank them. You couldn't, you had to be a real muscle builder for one of those. And they had what they called church keys to open them up. You remember church keys? How many of you remember church keys? Take a picture of who raised their hands. Okay. <laughs> well, these guys stopped, and they got this thing out, and they got the church key out. And, and so there's four of us in the car, a couple in the back and a couple in the front, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting scared. But I don't want these guys to know that I'm not one of the guys. So that they're up there, and they get the church key. They open that thing up, pass it over to the guy driving. That, that's back before seatbelts, and it was okay to drink and drive. Okay, 
So, <laughs> see, all these things used to be legal at one time. So then you get, and you got the other one, and he set it up over there, put it between his legs. We didn't have drink holders back in the day, or seat belts, or anything like that. So then, and he passes it. I, I think, oh no, he passes it back to the guy next to me. Opens that slits can and hands it back to me. Well, I'd never drank in my life, and. I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I knew it wasn't going to send me to hell, but it was one of those things, you know. I was a good church boy. So these guys are up there in the front, and they go, <coughs> well, they're drinking like men, you know. And every now and then, you know, they'd finish one, and they'd just throw it out the window. That was when it was okay. There were no anti-litter laws. That was where you were supposed to put your trash. You don't want to put your trash in your car. Come on. You throw it out. <laughs> My, how things change. So they threw it out. Well, there's pavement out there, and, it goes, and that beer can goes, tinka, 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 tink. Well, I'm in the back seat, and I'm thinking, man, what am I going to do? So I stick my tongue in that hole, you know. It's got a little triangle hole there thing. I stick my tongue in it. Well, that's good. Good liquor. Yeah, you know. I stick my tongue in there. Boy, I start acting a little drunk, you know. Hey! <laughs> so, you know, they pretty well threw all their cans out, and so I decided to throw mine out. There's, they throw them out, they go, take it, take it, take it. I throw mine out, and it goes, boom. <laughs> yeah, it was full. Yeah. So, well. But here's the whole thing I knew in my heart it wasn't right. You know, it's just kind of like when I snuck around into the baptistry of the church when I was 14 and kissed that girl. It wasn't right. You weren't supposed to do that in the baptistry. But see, you know that. Okay. Encourage your kids. Encourage your family. And here's, here's something else, too. You know, the Bible says that God, that Abraham was like God in this one thing. And that Abraham called those things that be not as though they are. And when it comes to family members, sometimes you just can't say things the way they are. You've got to say things the way they aren't. You've got to say what you want. And you start saying things like this, my family is a godly family. You know, half your family may be in prison for drug running and everything else, but, but you still got to, Make the confession, my family is a godly family. The Holy Spirit is teaching my family. My family will have revelation of the word of God. See, you say, well, that's not the way it is. No, I'm calling that thing that is not as though it is. If you keep, look, if you keep saying what you're seeing, then you're going to continue to see what you're saying. And as long as you continue to say what you're saying, then you're going to wonder why what you're seeing hasn't changed. And what you're seeing is not going to change until you change what you're saying. You have got to speak what God says about your family and not what you think about your family. It says, call your household blessed. In Psalm it says, call your household blessed. Now you can say, well, my household isn't blessed. And I'm not going to lie. No, we're not talking about lying. We're talking about by faith, you call those things that be not as though they were. Abraham, God called Abraham the father of many nations when he was an old dude and his wife was an old dudette, okay? And they were way past having children age. And God comes up and says to him, I call you the father of many nations. Hello? What do you do? He called those things that were not as though they were. All right. Well, let's take a look at a scripture on that, just so you'll know I'm not lying to you, which you guys wouldn't think I was lying to you anyway, right? Okay, I like that. Romans 4, 17. This scripture, Romans 4, 17, is where a lot of revelation is going to come. 
as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Did he say, I will make you? No, he said, he has made you. He said, I made you a father of many nations. And he's thinking, are you kidding? I don't have any kids. How can I be the father of many nations when I don't have any kids? I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who believe God, and here's two things that God does. He gives life to the dead. How many of you have had somebody taken physically in the last forever? My sister, my dad, your son. We can go right around the room here. God, you want to know one of the attributes of God? He gives life to the dead. That's one thing. And here's another attribute. He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And that's where the big change has got to take place in a lot of people. You got to quit saying what you see and you got to say what God's promise is. This is why the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight. You don't go by what you see, you go by what God said. When you believe God, that's faith. So believe God. You say, but it doesn't look that way. Forget how it looks. Believe God. But what do I say? You say what God says. You may have to even call those things that do not exist as though they do, as though they did. It's even past tense. You've got to quit condemning and cursing your household. Did you notice that earlier this evening when we were singing this joy that I have, how good you felt? This joy that I have. The world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Well, let's take a look at Nehemiah 8.10. Nehemiah 8.10. And that scripture tells us that the joy of the Lord, look at the end of it, do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when things start getting to the place where you're wondering, what am I going to do? Just crank it up. Roll the windows down in your car and start singing, this joy that I have, world wouldn't give it to me. No, 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 this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Come on now. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, and the world can't what? The world can't what? world can't take it away. Oh, yeah. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Why does the enemy want to steal your joy? He wants you to look at the way things are so that you won't say what God says. And if you look at the, the way things are, then trust me, many times your strength will just be zapped out of you because things don't always look good. It looked like, five years ago, it looked like our nation was going down the tubes when it came to Israel because we were doing everything that we could as a nation to destroy the nation of Israel. We gave billions and billions of dollars to their enemy. We funded terrorism. We blocked everything. We wouldn't move our embassy to Jerusalem. We wanted to give the Golan Heights back to Syria. And I heard a minister say in uh, Texas, we were in Texas, and he said, things look bad for the relationship between our nation and Israel. But he said, you got to quit looking at the way things are. you got to start confessing what you want them to be, what God promised. What did God promise? He promised that Israel would have the land from here to here. What did he promise? He promised that their capital would be in Jerusalem. What did he promise? That they would have, it's in the Bible, that they would have the Golan Heights. So here we are just a few years later, and what do we have? Yes, Jerusalem is the capital. Jerusalem is where the United States Embassy is. We quit funding terrorism. We acknowledge that they can have the Golan Heights. 
We are friends with them. We're giving them military aid. It's a complete reversal. I believe it's because of the prayers of the saints, because we believed what God said. You say, well, if God said it was going to happen, it was going to happen. Yes, but there's timing involved. And we may have brought it about quicker because of what we believed, prayed, and spoke. Yes. All right. Now, Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Now, that's good news. You say, well, what about the ones that have gone? They're getting that right now. If we could see the blessing that's being poured out on them right now. You know, how many of you in this room, and let's just be honest, how many in this room have had children that have already gone on to be with the Lord? Quite a few, quite a few. I'd say almost 50%. You need to understand that the blessing of the Lord is being poured out upon them right now. Beyond our comprehension. Oh, my goodness. Today, the, the gentleman that I met with, he said, he said, I'm really, really sorry about your sister. I said, well, it may be hard to grasp, but she's in a, she is in a real good place right now. And I tell you what, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but if you can see where she is right now and see what she's doing, I guarantee you, whatever they are, you'd trade places with her. Wow. Psalm 112. We'll close with this. Psalm 112, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Is that you? That means women too. Mankind. It includes women. Shannon, it's women. All right. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. Wow. And uh, there is a scripture in 2 Timothy 1.5 we should touch on where Paul is talking to Timothy and he's talking about the faith. Now you, you can just read this yourself on the monitors. But he's talking about the faith that was in the grandmother and his mother, and he's saying, now it's in you. What was Paul saying to Timothy? The faith that was in your grandmother even tells her name. The, first, the faith which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and then in your mother Eunice, I am persuaded, is in you. What's that let us know? Even with Timothy in the Bible, faith was passed down to him. Faith can be transmitted. You can transmit faith to your family. And then um, there's just a lot more. But to sum it up, basically my notes say this, don't give up. When you're standing nose to nose with the devil, the one that backs away is the one that loses. Do not back down. You stand for the word of God. You believe the word of God. You, you believe it. You stand on it. And then when things look bad, you believe it. And you stand on it. And then when things look worse, you believe it. And you stand on it. And then when it looks like all is lost, you believe it and you stand on it. And then when they're, they're coming to take you away, ho, ho, ha, ha, he, he, when it looks bad, 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 you believe it and you stand on it and you win. 
Uh, I'm going to give you one scripture out of memory. It's, it's okay because it's not in my notes and it's by memory. 1 John 5, 4. Let's put this one up. And this will be our closing scripture. I want everyone to stand. We're going to say it together. Now, we're not talking about a person because it says whatever. Look at somebody and say, you're not a whatever. You are a whoever, okay? <laughs> you know, whatever. So it's not talking about a person here. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Standing and believing is what overcomes the world. And when things look bad, we walk by faith and not by sight. We stand and believe, and the world loses. And when it looks like you want to sing uh, The Thrill is Gone by B.B. King, you don't sing that song. You sing This Joy That I Have, and just, just picture Jerry up here singing it, and it'll put a smile on your face, and you sing along with him, and this joy that you have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. You stand in faith, you believe God, and you will have what you're believing for, and you say what you're believing for instead of what you see. You call those things that be not as though they are. All right? Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak the blessing upon this congregation. I thank you for the anointing that is upon them. And I thank you, Father, for the revelation you're giving me right now about how some of them will even receive revelation tonight as they sleep. Dreams and visions from you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you all.